G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. We'll have all the show notes and any resources mentioned in the cast on our website. Launching in 2012 as Australia's first organic cider, the two founders, Sam Reed and Andrew Smith, have grown the business to now 25 full-time equivalent team members. Their cider sells all around Tasmania and on the mainland Australia through direct trade accounts, a distributor and the Dan Murphy's liquor chain. Soon after starting, they bought an old Apple Museum near their production facility and converted it into the Apple Shed for their cellar door based in the beautiful Huon Valley, 30 minutes south of Hobart. The shed hosts weddings and events and a mid-winter festival, which grew from 4,500 to now 20,000 people over four years, brought a strategic advisor into the monthly board meetings three or four years ago who has added a lot of clarity and value. Funding the growth mostly themselves, they have also had some asset and bank finance as well as around $750,000 in matched government grants. For Sam, an awesome team and culture has been crucial to their astonishing growth. He believes the hardest thing in growing a small business is work-life balance, feeling all on your own as a leader and keeping your business partnership strong. And advice he would give himself on day one is, it's not going to be how you planned it, it's going to take a lot more time and people than you think, and to forecast cash flow as well. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing Sam Reed from Willie Smith's Cider here in Tasmania. Sam's based in Sydney, so thanks for joining me today, Sam. Thanks for having me, Troy. Good to be here. Do you remember how we know each other? Well, I think it was uh, when I was living over in New York at the 2004 Aussie Rules uh, pub crawl when I was playing for the New York Magpies. A friend of yours, uh, James, a couple of friends of yours, James and Tina Patterson, were, uh, well, Tina wasn't playing at the time, but James was the captain and uh, invited you along. So it was uh, over in New York at an Aussie Rules pub crawl. That's right. And you guys had just lost the grand final, hadn't you? Uh, well, I would have been playing the B team, so uh, I probably can't. My, my recollection is probably not so clear, but um, you know. Uh. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I remember that, and then we didn't reconnect until seven or eight years later when we were both in Tasmania. Or well, I was living in Tasmania, and when you started Willie Smith, so it was. And then I kind of remembered that hazy, n- long night pub crawl in New York, and joined the dots. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I know Breno from Hobart Brewing from uh, playing netball with him in London so there's some old random connections in, in our friendship circle so yeah yes that's right Brendan Parnell from the Hobart Brewing Company who was on an earlier cast yeah so tell us a bit about Willie Smith uh, where it's located what it does when it started how it makes money uh, well Willie Smith is a partnership between myself and Andrew Smith the fourth generation apple farmer based down in the Huon Valley 30 minutes south of, of Hobart the Smith family have been farming there for four generations. And then Andrew and I met through a friend of mine. I was working at Diageo at the time, which is a drinks business, and I uh, was looking to do something different. And Smithy had some excess juice apples that he was looking to do something different with, which was probably going to be cider. Uh, so a friend of ours, a friend of mine, Glenn Barry, introduced the two of us, and we just got chatting from there. So I think that was in February 2011. And we launched Willie Smith's in November 2012. So, you know, 18 months later, I guess, after lots of toing and froing and talking and, and uh, going around in circles a bit. But yeah, eventually landed on the branding, the product, the formulation. And, uh, and so we were Australia's first certified organic cider to, uh, to hit the market as cider was really peaking, I guess you'd say. Uh, and I really saw that it was a great opportunity to do something crafted in that space. I was a fan of great wine and great spirits and and uh, great beer. And I thought I thought beer was pretty uh, pretty uh, cluttered space at that time. But I just thought there's a real opportunity to do something really good in the cider space. Um, so I tried a few French ciders, English ciders, and thought, well, how come we can't make these here in Australia? Um, and that was kind of how we set out. You did a bit of a recon over to France, didn't you, early on? Yeah, France and the UK uh, and also Spain, which is also a cider growing region. They all have their different personalities and traits in each market. So I guess I tried to take the best from both and um, and Willie Smith's was born, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah, I remember I'd just gotten back from London, living in London for four years, early 2011 and met you probably 18 months after that and thought it was a gap here in Australia because cider was obviously so big in the UK. Um, so, yeah, you've obviously hit on a winner there. 
Yeah, well, it was all very uh, either the sweet, fizzy stuff or very kind of thin and acidic. And uh, so we would try to find that kind of middle ground more in the French style. So not so carbonated, but, you know, not so acidic as well. Nicely, nice and rounded and well balanced. And, um, and Willie Smith's Organic was our first product and um, continues to be our lead product today. Yeah, great. Yeah, I love the organic, your organic, oh, sorry, your original, your original side is my favorite. That's the organic. So yeah, everyone knows it as the original. So I might have to rebrand it one day, but it is organic. And at the moment, I just think it's probably easier. It makes more sense to leave organic on pack, but you never know. And uh, uh, so Smithy's other business, the farm, they could they sell, are they the only supplier to Woolworths for organic apples? Maybe not the only. Well, over the years, they've been the only and then not the only necessarily, but certainly the largest supplier of organic um, apples to Woolworths. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so that gives a bit of context just how big the apple farm is that you guys get the juicing apples from. It. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously we built it. We built it on the farm there as well, of course, because um, yeah, you know the whole orchard to bottle story is pretty pretty important in craft cider in um in the UK and France, and so it just made sense. And obviously also crushing it right there and then putting it, you know, fermenting it right there. Yeah, just ensures that you um can control your product uh, quality that much. And well. And where do you sell, where does Willie Smith cider sell? Where do you sell it? Where is it available around Australia? Well, it's available all around Australia. Um, we've got national range, district ranging in Dan Murphy. So they've got about 220 stores. So that's the kind of, um, that gives us our reach, I suppose you'd say. Um, we go direct into Sydney, uh, Canberra and Victoria and Tasmania, of course. Uh, and we work with a distributor in uh, Queensland and WA as well. So. We've kind of got on-premise representation in all of those states. Yep. Uh, but, you know, we get our reach, obviously, through working with uh, Dan Murphy's National League, which is very helpful. Given we're, given our key part of um, who we are is our cellar door, the home of Willie Smith, Willie Smith's Apple Shed, uh, we get a lot of visitors from all over Australia. Yeah. And, um, you know, they always want to know where they can pick it up. Yeah. So, yeah, that's great. And yeah, the Apple Shed down there on a very busy highway. Uh, it's always um, popular when I um, head in there. And you have events and f- host a few weddings as well throughout the year. Yeah, a bunch of weddings functions is a big part of that. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's built in a 1942 Apple Packing Shed that used to be an Apple Museum. Actually, pictures of um, Charles and Anne Oates, Willie Smith's um, parents in law, inside the museum. So uh, when I saw them, I thought, we've got to have a crack at this. Um, this museum was a little bit tired, a little bit dusty, you know, just a pretty average experience. And I was thinking, how good would a bar be in here, you know? And, um, you know, we started off small and um, and it was a pretty big shed and we thought we'd never fill it. But nowadays it's bulging at the seams. It's a, it's a little shed that pumps pretty much every weekend throughout the year and um, and certainly, you know, during the busy tourist seasons, seven days a week. Um, yeah, we put a distillery in there now too based on my... Um, Exploration in France, I fell in love with Calvados uh, and I really was always intent on having a kind of working asset at the um, at the cellar door to kind of bring that to life. Obviously, sticking a cidery inside a cellar door is probably <laughs> too big to, uh, to be able to achieve that, but there's still really gives us that focus point, focal point, and it's, and it's a beautiful old Alambic copper still as well. So It is beautiful, yeah, because the, the cider production facility is about a kilometre away, is that right, from the shed? Yeah, that's right. Just five minutes down the road on the farm. So, yeah. And you also, for a few years now, been hosting down there at the Apple Shed the Midwinter Fest, which is a couple of weeks after the very popular Dark Mofo Festival. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, seven years coming up this year, actually. So, um, I uh, yeah, it's grown exponentially. So, wow. The idea was back when we launched the Apple Shed, it was super, super quiet in the Huon Valley um, in the middle of winter. Uh, so we had this a uh, dream of uh, waking up the dormant app, waking up the Hue and Valley um, business community and community in general, and letting people from outside the valley know the valley was open for business. All right. It also obviously helped offset probably some of the wages that we had during the, those times. When at that time we really just had a wholesale business, and the apple shed was was kind of a just a burgeoning business as well. Uh, so they were both very, very seasonal. And so having a focal point for us to get organized for and, and you know, use our staffing there. Um, and also obviously trying to draw attention to the Apple Shed and the Huon Valley to let people know uh, they could come all year round was, was a key focal point for it and key reason for doing it. Uh, and I went over to the UK and stumbled upon this um, 
ancient tradition called wassailing, which is where they um, run by Morris dancers, where they wake up the dormant apple trees and scare away the evil spirits by banging pots and pans and light, having big fly, flaming torches and firing shotguns through the trees. And thought oh, that sounds like a bit of fun. Let's let's have a crack at that. So, what started as a party, yeah, great, in our paddock next door to the apple shed, you know, with a four and a half thousand people rock up, which we were quite surprised at year one has moved into moved off site down to the Renala recreation grounds and you know gets around twenty thousand people over the course of the weekend over three days these days. So it's turned yeah. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, you've got a, a multifaceted business. You've got production, you've got uh, retail there with the cellar door, distributors that you use, Dan Murphy's, you've got events, uh, the midwinter fest events and event and weddings, etc. So it's yeah, quite a beast. Can you give us some kind of idea on like some key numbers to illustrate growth of the business? Oh, well, I mean, I guess now we've probably well, started with Smithy and myself, I guess. So that was just two of us. Um, we worked out reasonably early on that we're going to need to get a cider maker on board. So we got a good young fella called Raoul Muir Wilson join us. He was our first employee. And uh, and that was, you know, pretty much as we as we were kicking off. So Smithy and I and, and then Rowler and the business has now grown to, you know, around about 45 staff. Um, total staff with probably around uh, somewhere between 20 to 25 full-time equivalents, I guess, in the business. So, yeah, so, so it's growing, um, growing, well, just growing. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Two to, two to about 25 in eight years. That's, that's great. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And how about funding the business growth? Is it, uh, have you looked at any bank debt or investors or government, you know, funding grants, et cetera? Yeah, we've funded a number of different ways, but bootstrapping it would be, I guess, the way, the word to, to call it. We put our own money in to begin with. Um, so that was the initial funding we put in to get the cidery up and running. Uh, and then we put, put some more money in when it came to building the apple shed. Yep. Um, you know, obviously working with Smith, he's a very industrious fella and uh, got lots of tools such as, uh, well, all kinds of tools, including an excavator. So yep. we do things um, very efficiently and effectively whenever we can and whenever we do something. Um, but other than that, it's been, um, so we haven't put any more money in since that apple shed. But um, other than that, it's been really bank debt, um, you know, asset financing, really. And the funny thing about starting a business is they won't lend you any until you've actually got some. So it's bloody. Yeah. Uh, I used to do my head in in the early days, but anyway. Um, Frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, and then we managed to, um, you know, apply for a number of grants over the years. I think we've probably got around about three quarters of a million in grant funding to date, I suppose. Most of that, you know, match funding mostly, um, and that includes the Midwinter Festival as well. But um, but certainly that's been a big part of it. The funny thing is it, it achieves what they want you to do because it is match funding, so it makes you spend money that you weren't planning necessarily to spend anymore because you get at the time because you get excited by the idea. <laughs> And go all right. Well, how can we not do this if we're getting half of it match? But exactly, you still have to uh, pay for the other half. So, well, it's it's a good return for the government, obviously, because a lot of jobs down there in Huon Valley, uh, which is you know, where Tasmania is deemed a regional area in Australia in itself. So, thirty minutes south of the capital, Hobart is even more regional in that sense. So, I think the government made a good call there. We've been we've been very fortunate. They've held us up in, in you know in high regard for for what we've achieved, I guess, in terms of employment, but also just cultural and community impact, I suppose, you know, showing people that you can have a go. The Huon Valley, well, even, and Hobart is very, very different now, even five versus what it was five years ago. And um, and it's an exciting place to be, the Huon Valley. It's um, a lot of people wanting to move there to get that kind of um, small holding, small farm feeling and, and the community lifestyle. community lifestyle that it offers. Great. Can you outline one of the most stressful points in your small business growth journey to date? Oh, mate. Um, <laughs> funnily enough, I reckon it was probably... <laughs> Just pick one. Yeah, there's so many. But um, <laughs> well, well, it's probably the most recent one. Um, the Midwinter Festival is, you know, that it's been a real challenge. I've had a tendency just to uh, go for it and believe and be optimistic, which you have to do, really, let's be honest, if you're going to grow a small business. You have to have faith. And um, so uh, I think it's... Um, and the Midwinter Festival, you know, last year we moved it off site. I was very clear because it was just outgrowing our space at the Apple Shed. 
uh, and I was really clear that I didn't want anyone walking away from the event going, it wasn't as good as it was last year, you know, because we would have heard about it all year and it would have been painful to listen to. So, you know, we we over-invested. We, you know, made sure that it was going to be the best human midwinter festival we'd ever done, you know, ended up spending significant amount more than we we planned. But I was like, I, everything, I just kept going, yeah, let's do this because, you know, it's a bigger site. We've got more attraction to it. It's got more attention. We're going to get the people. Uh, and the ticket sales are going great, um, really, really well. And then, unfortunately, we got a month's worth of rain over the course of the weekend. So we ended up getting half of, half the number of people we um, we forecast um, to come along or planned to come along. And, um, and so that just really – and kind of the category growth slowing or me probably over-forecasting what I thought we could do um, – really just bit – after the festival, it all came home to roost, really, and uh, and so for the first time in my Willie Smith's life, I had I had to go back and you know focus on cutting budgets and uh, focusing on where we can save money. It wasn't never been a forte of mine, and it's still not um, not something I do well. But you know that was just a really stressful time because it, you know really obviously impacted people and impacted you know my positive demeanor I guess quite a lot and um you know really made me question myself obviously a lot too so yeah so that's um trying to put that behind me the last kind of five months of uh of 2019 uh, and start afresh so yeah yeah it is it is hard I've taken a kick in the guts many times been overconfident not say continually risks and the weather in Tasmania obviously is a big risk for any outdoor events or even indoor events so that one can be a little bit out of your control but I do love one of my favorite sayings, success is the poor teacher. So if you've been humming along, growing nicely and then not really checking in, uh, you know, you can open yourself up to being a little bit too aggressive or optimistic. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's just what I've, what I've done. And I think, you know, all good entrepreneurs, if you want to call yourself that, I don't necessarily like that word, but, um, you know, you can't do it without some kind of crazy belief and, in what they're doing and uh and so yeah it's um it, it, you know you just have to have it really so yeah and then i read about what that's called in a book called the hard thing about hard things and i might be jumping ahead here but when i read this chapter about it's called the struggle and it's called when things fall apart the struggle i love this is it the saying where he goes if you're going to eat shit don't nibble um the struggle is when you wondered why you started the company in the first place. The struggle is when people ask you why you don't quit and you don't know the answer. The struggle is when your employees think you're lying and you think they might be right. The struggle is when food loses its taste. The struggle is when you don't believe you should be CEO of your company. The struggle is when you know that you're in over your head and you know that you cannot be replaced. The struggle is when everybody thinks you're an idiot but nobody will fire you. The struggle is when self-doubt becomes self-hatred. You know, it goes on, but bloody hell, that hit a note to me uh, when I was reading that recently. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's timely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a friend of mine gave me that book to read, so he knows me well. And, uh, in fact, Glenn Barry, the guy who who introduced me to Smith, so, uh, he, he knew where I was at, and uh, that actually has helped change my mindset. So, yeah. That's great. That's really good. Well, the next question I was going to ask there was, what areas in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value to the business? Uh, me personally or the business, sorry? I guess the business, yeah. Well, I think, um, I mean, it might sound, I don't know if this is cheesy or not, but I think culture is like the thing you really have to uh, work on most. I think um, you can never take for granted the, you know, the employees that you have and with a great culture, you attract great employees and great employees are what you need to grow a small business. And if you don't, and fortunately at Willie Smith's, we've got a lot of great employees. And um, if you, and you're not going to be able to grow a business without great employees and great employees can go wherever they choose to. And so having a great culture they want to be part of um, is, is probably for me the number one thing that you can have and do if you wanted to grow a small business because you certainly can't do it alone. Um, I learned that fairly quickly. So, yeah. It must be hard because it's a little bit of a disparate business. You've got the retail Apple shed. You've got the production facility around the corner. You're based in Sydney. So I guess keeping that culture together with those three sites must be more of a challenge. Um, well, I think yes and no. I think it leads to some more autonomy for the for the staff. I think 
it probably makes having a great culture even that much more important, I suppose, too. So, and then it just places an even higher uh, focus on getting some good systems and processes in place and your recruitment as well. So, um, you know, we've been fortunate with the Apple Shed to have been able to have some some key employees who've been there since the beginning. Uh, they have created our culture out of the Apple Shed, really, that has kind of spread to the rest of the business. And um, so there is a there is a hub. I would say of our culture, and it is at the Apple Shed. So, um, yeah. And what have you enjoyed least about managing the fast growth? When it's not fast, <laughs> when it doesn't come along. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's a very you comment, Sam. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I love the um, fly by the feet of my pants stuff. Um, that's kind of my forte um i guess and whether i if, when you're running on adrenaline the whole time it's uh it's probably yeah when the growth when the growth comes off and you're uh not expecting it's probably what you know the, the hardest thing to manage i think and um thankfully we haven't really been there too much it's just having our first major uh hiccup you know we've obviously had a few hiccups and challenges along the way but first major one you know last year so um but yeah i think that's the Changing your mindset is, is is really hard, you know. Yeah, well, that was the next question. What the biggest mindset shift you've had to make uh, along the way of growing a small business? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that was probably fairly early on. You know, when you start, mm. you're going hell for leather. You're doing everything yourself, almost everything yourself, and you're doing it as as rapidly as you possibly can. And you know. I can, I've, I've got a tendency to be quite uh, abrupt, you might say, uh, direct, directive in my communication, um, demeanor, communication. Obviously, we all challenge and challenge when we're under stress, and that was mine. And you know, I've got a lot to huge agenda to get through. And um, you know, when it's you and a few people, you know, you just start firing and start doing as much as you possibly can because um, you need to. Um, once the business grew to a certain level. Uh, that style was just just became uh, just became probably too much, too confronting, and I had to learn to step back a bit and just you know do better and get better engagement, I suppose, and then work with people better, change my mindset a little bit to recognise um, that I wasn't doing everything anymore, and um, and yeah, so you know I got some pretty strong feedback probably around 2015, 2016. And I uh, got some got some coaching on my style, and um, you know it was that was a pretty challenging period, obviously um, for me, but you know certainly important. And sometimes it's just really hard to recognise that things when when things change, um, you, it's it's a challenge for you to recognise because you're so caught up in it, you know, especially when it's your own business. Yep. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So yeah, can't see the forest for the trees. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. I think I was exactly the same as what you've just outlined there early on in my business career, very direct, very driven, you know, expected a lot of people. And uh, yeah, it was when I was moving to London, actually, I asked our young general manager at our web firm in Melbourne, any feedback for me before I buy into this small IT company in London and grow it fast, anything I should really focus on to change and improve? And he said, well, you could manage people better because you, you know, piss people off. You don't really celebrate wins and successes. And so I went searching Googled online for good manager training and that's actually how I came across one of my favorite resources, which is the manager tools guys, Mark and Mike, the podcast they started 15 years ago. So yeah, I totally agree with you um, having to have an open mind to be able to change some of those things when you get the feedback. Oh, totally, yeah. And it, it certainly I wasn't ever close-minded, but it's just about you know people being able to give you that feedback and creating the space for people to be able to give you that feedback. Uh, and then you being able to recognize, you know, that things have changed. And like you say, because everything's so incremental in small business all the time, sometimes you just get caught up in it and you don't notice that things have changed. So, yeah. Yeah, boiling frog syndrome. And what's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? Yeah, I don't know. That's a pretty good one. Pretty good question. Number one habit. Well, I mean, I would just say keep going i suppose it's not really a habit but just keep going and keep moving um you know the things are always changing and you you know you don't want to think too much you want to keep moving i suppose and whether that's out of fear or paranoia or drive or whatever it is i think you just got to 
keep on moving and make sure you just sit down and get through things and crack through them, you know, because there's a lot of things to do. Um, that's as a, as a small business owner, obviously, as you, as you get more employees, it becomes probably a bit less relevant. You've got to make sure then you're, you're really listening to your employees and I suppose ensuring that you, you know, instilling that culture and passion, um, in the team and that get, got that real clarity of objectives for them and for the business. So everyone knows where they're going. But yeah. Yeah. Want to become the best manager you can be? Check out our kick ass manager course at growasmallbusiness.com. Do the course and add your fellow managers for no extra cost. Join the 30%. 70% of people quit their job because of their manager. Well, that leads on to the next question, which is you know, how you've added people to the team and if you can share some wins and mistakes and advice you'd give to those listening. Yeah, sure. I think, um, well, we've been fortunate in being in Tasmania, obviously. It's a pretty small market and pretty small town. Um, so you can, you know, put the, put the word out on the street and usually find people through other people. I think, uh, even though we've advertised and written our role profiles, and I think it's really important to write role profiles. I'm a big, big, um, big believer in role profiles and job descriptions uh, because if you if there isn't one, then what are you employing them for? So, but then you know, and we've always advertised on Seek. But the best hires we've got have all been referred, really, at the end of the day, by friends and and people we know, um, and they generally just tend to be. You know, that, then they've just become the right cultural fit. We've kind of built a kind of family friendly business in a sense, a family business, a friendly business. And, and so, you know, people who are in the same headspace as, are, as us, um, you know, generally all love Tasmania. So we've all got kind of one thing that we, we love getting after and can unite us as well. Um, we love showcasing Tasmania and the best of Tasmania. Uh, so that's, that's, pretty important too, kind of a shared vision as well. So, yeah. Yep. It was a good point you made, Dan. I interviewed Rod, uh, the founder of Stillwater and Black Cow, the two great restaurants in Launces in your hometown. Interviewed Rod last week and he said the same thing to this question that a lot of their staff after the few years up and going were just coming through referrals. People loved working at uh, Stillwater and, and started telling their friends so they really didn't have to go through too many formal recruitment procedures because they had such a, uh, a network there to dive into of quality people. Yeah, no, it's, it's once and what, and you know, and it just pays back. It's culture paying back. If you've got a, if you've got a good culture and seen as a good place to work, then more and more people are going to want to work there. So it's like a virtuous cycle. It takes a little while to get going, but um, once you get going, certainly worth spending time on. And that's the next question. What are some of the things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Uh, well, I'm I'm big on vision. Um, you know, I think um, being big on vision, uh, being open about what you're trying to achieve, being clear about what you're trying to achieve, engaging as many people in the organisation with that, um, and having so regular regular communication. Yeah, regular communication. Um, I think I took a leaf out of your book there for a while. Um, I've dropped off since then, but with my uh, updates, but I've dropped off a little bit. But your weekly email. Yeah, yeah. But um, oh, I did monthly. I couldn't get that far. But um, regular communication in terms of you know our purpose and where we're going and what we're trying to achieve, and you know sharing the wins. Absolutely, I've been always love celebrating wins and probably arguably too much as well. Um, but you know it's all pretty exciting when you get started. That's for sure. So. Yeah, sharing wins, um, making sure everyone's feeling like they're part of it um, is really important and you can share wins and from everywhere, every part of the organisation because um, everybody adds to the culture, you know, and everyone's got a role to play in that culture. Um, so, so I think that's really important. I think there's also uh, a real focus that everybody's got to own the culture. There isn't someone responsible for culture um, and you can't just make someone responsible for culture. I don't believe you can and I don't think you should. Everybody has to know they're all responsible for culture and they've all got some personal interest in it and some personal co contribution to make because, um, yeah, you, you don't want it to be about, you know, well, I don't like this culture. Well, you're like, well, if, but if you don't like it, what are you doing? You created it. So, you know, so people have to take some ownership and, and that's probably got to be pretty clear as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. How much professional development did you invest in yourself? Um, 
I haven't invested. Yeah, any areas you felt you really had to swat up on, really get some more knowledge and skills on over your journey so far? Uh, I think really, you know, cider making at the start was probably the key one, I suppose, and um, going going and spending time overseas, finding out what best in class looked like um, so that I could share that and see or so that I'd know that when I came back and saw what we were doing. Um, so you'd also have a bit of a network and you could ask questions of people overseas because, you know, in an industry it's always helpful to know know people and people are much more happy to give you advice from the other side of the world than from next door because you're less likely to be a competitor. Um, and, you know, and so, yeah, they're much more free-flowing. Um, so I think it was really mostly mostly that to, to, be, on, to be honest. Um, and then a lot of it was working with Smithy, who's been a family business, small business operator, not small really anymore, but has been a small family business operator for since his whole his whole career. And there is a different style, you know, of corporate versus family business or small business and, uh, and you know, needed to spend a lot of time with Smithy and, and try and understand those dynamics and differences, you know. Um, you know, you can't just bring – yeah, you can't just bring big corporate into uh, into small business. Uh, you've got to you've got to bring it in at the right pace, you know. So it's always been a bit of a tension point, I guess, between um, Smithy and myself. Is uh, I've always wanted to bring more corporate stuff in, and um, he's always probably not seen the benefit of doing so. But you know, we kind of meet, that in a sense bring means we bring it in at the, at the kind of right pace, right level. And you bring the best of both worlds because you, your background uh, was you were with Diageo for quite some time as a brand manager, weren't you? Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. Yep. So uh, it's a big corporate machine. I think they've got something like eighteen thousand. Well, I had fifteen. Yep. Fifteen years in corporate um, with BP, Castrol, and and Diageo around the world. So yeah. Yeah, that's right. I think uh, Diageo has got about eighteen thousand sales reps around the world. David Vitali from Starwood told me a couple of years ago. It's a pretty big. Pretty big machine. And what about? Yep, it's a machine. <laughs> Have you had any mentors or coaches along the way? Uh, no, um, unfortunately, I've just uh, I've tried to engage along the way with a few people. Uh, to oh, I suppose lots of people to talk to, but never never formalised anything. I suppose so. Um, so you bounce bounce around in your network, talk to Greg, myself, and other business owners, and, and when you when you hit a roadblock or you've got a challenge, I guess. Yeah, there's that, you know, like talking to uh, good mates with Jamie and Brad up at Stone and Wood as well. So they've always got some um, good words to say, I suppose, but never anything particularly formal uh, in that sense, I guess. Um, you know, I've picked Howard Kearns' brains a few times and the big brains they are, um, but but nothing. Yeah, ex little creatures founder. Yeah, it's fantastic, isn't he? Yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, where possible, tried to uh, engage, um, but never formalised anything. Uh, we've got a strategic advisor, though, who we brought on probably three or four years ago. And so he's been, you know, just a bit of a, a guide or a steady hand, you know, someone to bounce ideas off, I suppose. So, yeah, that's it. We have a monthly board catch up with, uh, with him. And, uh, and that certainly has helped, for sure. All right, well, let's get into the final five questions then. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Yeah, well, I wrote some answers to these ones, actually, and then I ended up with about uh, three answers to this one. Um, I don't know if I can have three or not, but I'm going to use it. <laughs> Go for it. Um, obviously, work-life balance is just obvi uh, an obvious one, of course, but you know, just recognizing that if you're starting a small business, it's usually because you're super passionate about what you're doing, and when you're super passionate about what you're doing, you do more of it because you love it. And then that can obviously have challenges on the rest of your life and impact your relationships. So, Yeah, well, you, you and Anna have Sophie and... And Edward, yep. And Edwards, two, yeah, two young kids. So that's quite a, a fair bit of pressure on, on you both, yeah. Yeah, and she works full-time too. So, I mean, I'm fortunate to have a wife who's understanding of me and my foibles and supportive. Um, very supportive. Mm. And, uh, and so from that perspective, but, you know, like it, it's not just you, you, your uh, life partner, but your friendships and, and you know, all, all of your relationships really because they 
at certain times become second, secondary, or even thirdly, as you are trying to achieve what you're setting out to do. Uh, that's so. That's pretty hard, and, and and recognizing that. I've lost, yeah, I've lost relationships over the twenty years I've been in small business, romantic as well as friendship. <laughs> certainly, that's yeah, not waking up and seeing the the balance side of things early enough. What are some other hard things you think about growing? Well, I think there's another one about you know feeling all on your own. It's quite easy um, to feel all on your own, um, and that's not a good thing. You are. This is just part of being a leader, though. I mean, everyone who's a leader has to experience that. Um, but you know, trying to get a network um, of people that you can talk to, bounce ideas off, and feel like you're not alone um, outside, you know, your business and outside probably your industry as well is uh, is a pretty important thing to to do i'd say but then you know in in smithy and i are partners in this business and that's probably on reflection the hardest thing of all is just keeping our partnership strong you know when we started smithy said well you know we're getting married and um and he said this is just like a marriage and um you know it's like your marriage. You've got to work on your marriage. Totally agree. Yeah. Just as, and you've got to work on your partnership in business just as much. You've got to work on your marriage. You know, it's um, just how, how it is um, because it's a vital, vital relationship. And, um, yep. and if you're not aligned in marriage or, or business, then um, it all goes to shit. Yeah. Things come off the rails fairly quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And your favorite business book is that hard thing about hard things or something else? Well, that's. That's the one I'm in at the moment and uh, definitely highly recommended. But I think um, back to that kind of challenging point in my career um, when I got some feedback, I've read, I read, I got online, Googled a few things and came up with this and, and actually spoke to um, an HR, former HR representative, Diageo, and she recommended um, Leadership and Self-Deception, um, which is by the Arbinger Institute. It's an awesome, awesome book, uh, really quite a simple read. But really, just blew my mind and changed my changed my life and changed my perspective of my around relationships. Um, and this is work and personal relationships as well. So, um, I'd recommend anyone to have a crack at that. It's about it's about just taking um, taking ownership more, you know, of of relationships. And really, there's just a nice story to follow through and taking you know taking ownership of the situation you're in and not not using justification for why you did this, you know, because as soon as you start to justify anything, you're essentially in the wrong and you know it. But, uh, you yeah. know, but that was just a huge, huge insight. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I'm definitely going to add that to my list. What about any great podcasts or online learning tools you've used for professional development? Yeah, I really don't, to be honest, I'm not a massive, um, podcast. Yeah. Yeah, I might probably just try and spend time with my kids instead of when I'm not working and try and work as hard as I can and then try and spend as much time as I can with my kids or with in my family life. So I have I'm not have never been very good at, at keeping up with stuff like that to be honest. But I mean I think Tim Reed does the small business big marketing podcast. Um and I listened to a few of them. You know, I, I was interviewed by Tim a few years back when we, um, you know, were nominated for the Telstra Small Business Award and our story caught his eye. And, and, and you know, I listened to quite a few of, uh, back then at the time of, of what he was talking about. And in terms of not feeling alone, that's a great, um, great listen for a lot of different, okay. different various businesses that are out there. And one tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? It could be anything. Yeah, well, I wrote down some words here. I'm not sure they're tools, but um, I think it is passion, faith, drive and paranoia. I think uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a healthy mix. Yeah, yeah, there is. And I think that there's this book called Great by Choice that I identified with. They kind of talked about um, what makes a great company. And I think the thing that there are three things in this book that make a great company. And the thing that struck home with me was, um, was paranoia. You're always working because you're always trying to improve trying in a continuous improvement because you're worried that someone else is going to do a better job than you shortly. And, um, and I think that's that paranoia almost that comes out in passion to other people potentially, but there's a certain level of paranoia that you're always working hard to, uh, to try and improve your business and stay ahead of the game. And I think that's what you really need to do. So, Yeah, that's great. Really good. I'm going to add that one to uh, my list as well. And the final question here, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting a small business? Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's not going to be how you planned it. And 
it's going to take a lot more effort, a lot more work, and a lot more people to deliver what you wanted to, wanted to achieve here, son. And uh, so make sure you really uh, know what you're doing, and um, and yeah, and also make sure you're forecasting cash flows. Yeah, that's a very very good advice. Have you heard of the four by two rule? I haven't heard of that. No. I heard a VC in London when I went to a function speak about this because he gets pitched a lot for young entrepreneurs wanting his money or his group's money. And he said he made up this term called the four by two, which is it's going to take, like, it's either going to take four times as long and cost twice as much or take twice as long and cost four times as much. The difference is you get to choose. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a very good rule and uh, and it absolutely makes sense. Well, I think it's so far, I think I was going to be retired in three years. So we're uh, coming up to nine years. So I'd say I'm going to be at least four, four at times in terms of, uh, of time. Um, we've probably kept the money pretty good though, to be honest, in, contri- in contribution. So yeah, there you go. That would explain it for sure. Yeah. That's great. You, you certainly are optimistic, bullish and driven, aren't you, Sam? So congratulations to you and Smithy and the team on the growth um, from two to 25 staff over you know the last eight years. The brand, the brand I consider it uh, probably Australia's best cider and uh, craft cider, independent cider. So I think, yeah, well done to you all. I think you've done a great job. Thanks very much, Matt. Really appreciate it. No worries. And thanks for the chat today. Yeah, thank you. We'll catch you soon. We'll have all the show notes and any resources mentioned in the cast on our website. Launching in 2012 as Australia's first organic cider, the two founders, Sam Reed and Andrew Smith, have grown the business to now 25 full-time equivalent team members. Their cider sells all around Tasmania and on the mainland Australia through direct trade accounts, a distributor and the Dan Murphy's liquor chain. Soon after starting, they bought an old Apple Museum near their production facility and converted it into the Apple Shed for their cellar door based in the beautiful Huon Valley, 30 minutes south of Hobart. The Shed hosts weddings and events and a midwinter festival which grew from 4,500 to now 20,000 people over four years, brought a strategic advisor into the monthly board meetings three or four years ago who has added a lot of clarity and value. Funding the growth mostly themselves, they have also had some asset and bank finance as well as around $750,000 in matched government grants. For Sam, an awesome team and culture has been crucial to their astonishing growth. He believes the hardest thing in growing a small business is work-life balance, feeling all on your own as a leader and keeping your business partnership strong. And advice he would give himself on day one is, it's not going to be how you planned it, it's going to take a lot more time and people than you think, and to forecast cash flows well. 